Okay, here's another example. I'm going to another worked example of um, thinking about a particular linear system and thinking about these concepts about independence and uh, can we solve things, can we find combinations, things like that. So here's a system, a homogeneous linear system. And there's various reasons we might be led to thinking about that system. But one of them would be if we had this question. If v1 was 3 minus 3, 6, v2 was 5 minus 2, 1, and v3 was minus 4, 4, minus 8. And there's lots of questions we could ask about that. And so one of them is, is this set, uh, is, I guess, the set, v1, v2, v3, linearly independent or not? If you know the answer, don't shout it out, please. And if it's not, what are the dependence relations? In exactly what way can we play them off against each other to make zero? Or another way, you can easily uh, rejigger that, as we say, to figure out, can I make one out of co a combination of the others? Um, and then another question we got to toward the end of uh, class time was, can I make some other random vector w from v1, v2, v3. That's called taking the span of the set and looking at all the vectors I can I can make out of those. Okay, so let's look at, uh, sort of focus on the first question first, linear independence. So here's the, I, I put together the augmented matrix where this one is zero. It's, per it's purposely an, a, a homogeneous system. And so homogeneous systems we've talked about are important. They're simpler than inhomogeneous ones. And here's one use of them. It's really exactly what you, you're led to when you ask the, the dependence question. Are these vectors, is this set of vectors redundant in some way? Well, reducing on the first column gives you this. You can work that out if you pause the video if you're unsure about that kind of thing. Second, uh, reducing under here, you get this. And I want to stop right here and say this is pretty special. It was certainly a little special because I had zeros over here. That's just making it homogeneous. And now I've got a row of zeros along the bottom. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to box the pivots, or what the, our book calls the leading entries. I like pivot because it's shorter. And it, it suggests how incredibly important they are. They're pivotal. Now, um, we can actually go all the way to the reduced row echelon form by dividing by threes and killing this one extra entry up here. And what I was pointing out in the lecture was how nice that is. And I mean, it's just nice in all possible ways. It answers all possible questions if you if you just know what sort of which questions to ask uh, about this matrix and in particular about these three vectors. Um, because what this says is, remember what if we if we write this equation back out in terms of the variables c1, c2, and c3, it says c1 minus 4 thirds c3 equals 0 and it says c2 actually equals 0 and c3 is arbitrary. And it's that arbitrary that's absolutely the most important thing. If C1, C2, and C3 were actually determined, we talked about how the only solution would be 0, 0, 0. Well, that's great, but um, that would say that there's no way to play these vectors off against each other to make 0. Because when I look at the definition of independence, it explicitly says they're independent if the only way to make the 0 vector out of a combination of them is 0. What this is saying is quite the opposite. There is a non-trivial way to make the zero vector. For example, I could just plug in c3 equals 1, uh, c2 now does have to be zero, and uh, c3, or sorry, c3 is 1, and so c1 is 4 thirds. 
So that's C1, C2, C3. Equal, there's an equals there. I'm kind of squeezing it in. Sorry. Okay. So what does that mean? And back to our orig original vectors, it means that if I take four thirds times the the first vector plus just w uh, one times the second vector, we can verify. Oh yeah, that is zero. Four thirds times three is four. Four thirds times six is eight, and I do get the zero vector. Okay. Now, what does this mean geometrically? Now, this is a very special case, and you might have seen at the start, if you were stop paused or were thinking about it, you might have noticed that these columns were just multiples of each other. So, what this means is the second column, it turned out, wasn't really necessary. It's not really crucial. The reason these are dependent is simply that these two vectors are collinear. And so, I've got two vectors. One is four-thirds of the other. Oh, that's not really four thirds, is it? Oh well, this is v three, and this whole thing is v one, and then v two is going off in some other direction. As far as it's concerned, hey, I'm trying to help out here. I'm trying to produce new stuff and explore new civilizations and all that. But um, v three and v v one together are not doing a very good job because they're redundant. I could either pick on v three and say you're the one I should get out of here because you're redundant, or I could pick on v one equally. But together, all three of these guys are coplanar because these guys were actually collinear to start with. Notice um, that that remember that that v2, the c2 in front of that co of of v2 had to be zero. Why is that? If I have any linear combination of v1 and v3, it's going to be along this line. Is there a way I can take v2 and use it to kill a combination of v1 and v3? No, because v1 and v3 is going to be along this line. The only thing that could kill that is something along that line. So v1 and v3 can kill each other, which is what, ma what makes this set dependent. But uh, I actually can't put in a v2 if I, my purpose is to get 0. Another way to say that is that um, even though v1 can be expressed as a combination of v3 and v2, in fact, v1 can be expressed just in terms of v3, and v3 can certainly be expressed in terms of v1 and v2, in fact, it can be expressed just in terms of v1, I can't make v2 out of a combination of v1 and v3. So this is what I was saying about the definition of linear independence, how it's nice and symmetrical, and it includes these kinds of cases automatically, but if you start picking on one vector or another, it gets confusing. It's certainly true that there is a non-zero combination of C1, C2, and C3. They're not all zero. This satisfies this equation. That's a dependence relation. But I couldn't pick on V2. I can't pick on V2 and say, in terms of V1, V3, something over here. Not going to work. Because the actual coefficients I had here were, of course, 4 thirds plus 0 plus 1. Okay, so that's a bit of a special case, but the main thing is that looking at this uh, matrix told us the answer. Now, one thing I mentioned also in class is a way to talk about it purely within the matrix language and purely with about a statement about columns of matrices and how they behave under row reduction. It becomes a very clean statement, although it does kind of distill the geometry out of it, which is sometimes good and sometimes a little uh, disturbing. It's saying that if I'm looking for a dependence relationship among these columns, Whatever dependence relationship is here, it's exactly the same as the dependence relationship among these columns, and vice versa. And so the fact that one uh, four thirds times this column plus er, equals, or let's say minus one times this column, sorry, plus one times this column, I'm getting confused. Okay, so four thirds of that plus one of that gives us zero. That must have been true up here. Now here it's pretty easy to see because it's such a simple dependence relationship. But in the example in class, it was more interesting. Any dependence relationship among the columns here is the same as what I get up here. And that's one of the theorems in, in the book. I think it was a, a 71, page 71 or something like that. I'll stop the video here.